Hey, Dr. C here with you. So let's talk about coffee. Is coffee something that's going to benefit your health or make you better in some way, or is it going to be harmful? And it's funny because these views have oscillated wildly over the last decade or so. A uh, short answer of this one is that if you enjoy some and you don't really have any real issues in terms of anxiety or sleep or food cravings, it's probably harmless, maybe some slight benefit. If you don't do well with it, on the other hand, you're probably not going to miss out on anything. Here's the details. There were studies prior to the uh, early 2000s showing that coffee intake had a strong correlation with cardiovascular death, with heart attacks, and even in small amounts. And that led to a strong idea that it was simply more of a vice, more of an indulgence, more of something harmful. And it turned out that these studies were all of a certain type. They were all older, and they were all looking at Nordic populations that were consuming unfiltered coffee. So you basically make like cowboy coffee or hobo coffee where you boil coffee grounds in water and then just do a quick straining of the grounds. And that's horribly harmful. There are many compounds that build up in that that are damaging to the cardiovascular system. But in modern usage with filtered coffee, that's very different. Then there was a group of newer studies suggesting that higher intakes of coffee had numerous health benefits. And there were plausible mechanisms for this. You know, a general rule with plant foods is that the things that stain are often things that have a lot of health benefits. And yeah, coffee stains like nobody's business. This staining is a function of plant pigments, and mostly these are polyphenols. Many polyphenols can act as antioxidants. They can act as cofactors in connective tissues. They do a lot of good stuff in the body in general. So when there were other studies suggesting positive health outcomes, well, then it seemed plausible. Now, a lot of these studies turned out to be tied to socioeconomic status, meaning that people that had more of that often consumed higher amounts of coffee. And a lot of the benefits were more tied to the socioeconomic status than it was to the simple coffee intake. But there has survived a certain number of studies showing that higher coffee intakes correlate with lower risks for diabetes. And that seems to be a decent correlation. Now, a couple of wrinkles. One big wrinkle is that there's a lot of genetic variation in caffeine clearance. What I mean by that is coffee has many different constituents of which one of the big ones is caffeine. I mentioned some of the polyphenols. There's also alkaloids as well, many other compounds. But caffeine is one of the alkaloids, and it's a biologically active alkaloid. And what happens is we ingest it, and our liver breaks it down to other constituents and eventually eliminates it. Now, how long that takes and how we respond to caffeine give rise to a lot of individual differences. And they exist. Uh, there are many people that drink coffee all the time and go to sleep right afterwards. And there's others that can have the smallest amounts and can have dramatic negative side effects from that. And this actually can change. There are also those who can overconsume it and end up creating more of an intolerance than they probably would have just based upon their genetics. So some studies have looked at cardiovascular outcomes and it's separated people based upon their gene variations. And some of these have shown that those who have the genes making them poor clearers of caffeine, they actually have more rates of cardiovascular death when they consume even smaller amounts of that. Now, in most cases, people like this have pretty dramatic side effects of insomnia, you know, anxiety, irritability, racing heart. And many can get that even with very small amounts. So if you're someone like that, please know that you probably don't have to buck your symptoms and push through them in hopes of having some health benefit from caffeine. It probably would not apply to you. So that's where we see a lot of these differences. Some of those same studies showed that others who cleared it better probably had decent outcomes. Now, one thought is, should I go look up at 23andMe and see my genotype? Well, there's gene types and gene expression, and ultimately your personal tolerance is a better indicator of that. And how do you know your tolerance? Well, if you already know that a little bit of caffeine sends you through the roof, you know that you're not a good clearer of that. And on the other hand, if you know that, you can consume it and have no symptoms. Now, the one thing I would say is that there are those who consume it regularly and have symptoms, but they assume the symptoms are normal or they're just part of their own unique makeup when they're really not. So that can happen. And you can suspect that if you're someone to where the idea of missing coffee freaks you out. 
<laughs> so if the idea of stopping it for a few weeks freaks you out, you might be someone that's better off having less of it. Just to put that out there, I've had so many people over the years that struggled with anxiety or insomnia or blood pressure. And before I would get deep into, you know, diagnosing odd conditions or talking about various exotic treatments, I would ask them about their caffeine intake. And when they had last taken several weeks off of caffeine, many had not for years. And they couldn't even wrap their head around the fact that that was a possibility. And the trend that I observed was that the more someone was freaked out or opposed to the idea of taking a little caffeine holiday, the more likely they were to have a transformative positive experience from doing so. <laughs> so that was, that was tricky. Uh, the other thought too is that there's a great deal of differences in how it can correlate with longer term changes in body weight. So there's a stage that we go through called hepatopause, and that's one to where over time our liver works differently. And after hepatopause, our liver may not process caffeine in the same way that it did beforehand. Now, this is another pause, and it occurs during the same time in which the most commonly thought of pauses occur, as in menopause, perimenopause, and andropause for men. So somewhere around mid-40s, mid-50s, caffeine might work differently for us. And in those cases, it may have more of a negative effect upon body weight than it did before. And then we think too about energy levels. And this is curious. So how caffeine works is that it blocks adenosine receptors. Let me back up a step. So our brain makes energy, actually all of our body makes energy, by using a high energy molecule called adenosine triphosphate. You might have heard of ATP. Basically, you've got this adenosine backbone and tri-3 phosphate tails that attach onto it. Each one you pop off yields a fair amount of energy. And when it's all done, you've got adenosine left over. And ideally, you would take that and replenish the phosphates. That takes some work, takes some time. Now, when there's a lot of adenosine floating around, that's a signal for your body saying that it's time to be tired. It's time to slow things down. It's time to take a rest and replenish your ATP. So adenosine makes you feel tired. And there's receptors for that in the body, especially in the brain. When a lot of adenosine is around, you feel tired, you're less mentally alert. Now, caffeine, it works by blocking adenosine receptors. So it doesn't take away adenosine. It doesn't make ATP more quickly, but it does block the adenosine receptors. So what that means is that you're still tired, but you don't feel it. <laughs> you're not functioning better. You're just not aware of feeling tired. And the weird thing is that there's a cycle when you ingest caffeine, you now you've blocked the receptors again. And so now you're not feeling the fatigue. You're not performing better, but you're simply not feeling the fatigue. And then when you go through caffeine withdrawal, then the fatigue hits you in spades. There's even more of it because now you've got this backlog of adenosine and more adenosine receptors than you would have had. So that's, that's a cycle that people go through. So using caffeine, it doesn't give you more alertness or energy than you would have by yourself, but it does temporarily take away fatigue symptoms. And it'll also then make it harder to rebuild adenosine. So there's no, there's no net loss from it, but the way in which you feel like you're more alert, it's kind of an optical illusion because you're actually not more than you would be on your own. You're just taking away a side effect of caffeine withdrawal from the day before. So a whole lot of things to think through. If you're someone to where you have a cup most days, take it or leave it, nothing to worry about, no big things to change. Do consider, of course, quality and purity and organic sources of that. Definitely you want filtered coffee. There can be some pH effects. It can be rather acidic. And some do better to have a little bit of milk or a plant milk with there to stop it from being a pH irritant on the intestinal tract. But if you tolerate it, it can be a nice source of some good polyphenols, some possible health benefits. If you're someone who doesn't tolerate it, if it makes your heart race or you feel anxious or jittery, you can skip it and you can do fine. Some people like you do fine with it every now and then, and some do fine with decaffeinated products. There's different versions of those. Some are decaffeinated with water processes. Others that don't specify that often are using some harmful solvents, mostly hexane, to take the caffeine out. So if you do like decaffeinated, you want water process. And it's worth knowing that if you ever get decaf when you're at your favorite coffee place, there might still be a lot of caffeine in there because they're not all the same from type to type. So yeah, if you don't tolerate it, you may have some on occasion. You may do okay with decaf 
or you may be in a subset that's better off just completely avoiding all versions of that. And that can include coffees, teas, and chocolate products. And then there's also those to where they can have it on a more regular basis. But if you're that person, I would still encourage taking at least once a year, taking a few weeks off, taking a little holiday. You can let your adenosine receptors reset. You can see if your caffeine clearance has changed. You can see if there were any symptoms that had snuck up on you, like just poor sleep quality or poorer mood or less steady energy levels. And if not, if you're good, you can be deliberate about your use once you're informed of it. All right, that's it. Take great care of yourself. We'll talk in really soon.